Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about this three worlds model, which uh, appears in the road to reality at the end. I think, we no, it's the beginning, that's right, because I have two of my books, Shadows of the Mind is at the end and The Road to Reality is at the beginning. I think that's it, yes. <laughs> anyway, it was a sort of my way of trying to sort out things, which I'll try and get to here. This is a not an over. This is projection from the above, isn't it? So I could show. Yes, that's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Now here is my picture. I better get this out of the way. And I think that's what this chair is for now. Um, this is a picture of the the three worlds. Actually, I want to talk more about the three mysteries. You see, the worlds. I should explain the idea here. Is that well, people think of the world m mostly in terms of the physical world. That's this one down here. That's the world of you know, tables and chairs and planets and galaxies and um, atoms and all these things. And this is the world of our conscious experience. So that's uh, consciousness. And this is the platonic world of mathematical concepts, which I regard as a separate thing. If, if you're not a mathematician, often people People who are not mathematicians are having trouble thinking this is a world out there. And somehow mathematics is maybe the product of our consciousness or something like that. But it's hard to be a product of something over here when this seems to be something dependent on something down here. And the operations of the physical world seem to accord with mathematics to an extraordinary pre precision. And now the precision we now know is really extremely remarkable, both in the quantum area and in general relativity. So we see an extraordinary precision. And this is the mathematical precision and the mathematical laws which govern the way the world appears to operate were there long before there were any human beings. And so how can this world be the product of us if somehow we weren't there and so on. So I've always had trouble with that point of view and being a mathematician, uh, it, I feel there's a sort of analogy more with archeology span than you might think. You sort of dig away and you find something and that something has been there all the time. It may not have been recognized previously, may not have been understood previously, but it's been there all the time. And the view that it's somehow a product of our consciousness is not something which um, I can really accept. Now, what are these things here? Well, these are the mysteries. The world's here, and these three things are the mysteries. And the mysteries are, first of all, why is it? This um, Wigner, the great physicist Eugene Wigner, pointed this out at one point. The uh, remarkable, I can't remember his phraseology now, but it was how extraordinary that these laws are satisfied by nature and that we have laws simple enough to understand that seem to govern the way the things operate. So that somehow this is that mystery. And the mystery is also illustrated in this way that there's a rather small path here which seems to engulf the whole world. So we seem to see, if you look at any mathematical journal pretty well, you will see that almost all the articles have nothing whatsoever to do with the physical world. I shouldn't perhaps say that if you're trying to support mathematics, which I do want to support, but most of the mathematics, maybe eventually it will have some important role to play in, in the world we live in, but most of it is just done for its own sake, which is fine as far as I'm concerned. But in the picture here, you see most of that mathematical world doesn't seem to have anything to do, at least not that we can see, to do with the laws which govern the physical world. And likewise, the part of the physical world which seems to evoke consciousness is extraordinarily small as far as we can see. I mean, maybe trees are conscious. There is some conceivable evidence there's something there, but I don't think many people think that. Nevertheless, we have people, a lot of them in this room now, uh, and those are all conscious. And uh, in my view, the, the dogs that some of them may own are also conscious. I think that this quality goes quite far down in the animal kingdom. I wouldn't like to say how far down. So I don't think it's entirely a human thing. But it's something which seems to be there as a product of things going on in the physical world. And they have to be organized just right for this consciousness seemingly to come about. So it's a very tiny part of this physical world, which seems to be 
uh, encompassing this whole of this world of mentality. And, again, you might say, well, even the mathematician doesn't think of mathemat mathematics all the time. Um, I can say from experience, I don't think of mathematics all the time. So it's only a small part of the mental activity which has to do with somehow accessing this world up here. So I've drawn this rather paradox paradoxically, in fact, a bit deliberately, and um, I think I put my picture down here somewhere. I'm not quite sure what kind of a projector this is, and if I put a blank thing up there, will it... Uh oh dear, I don't see it. Never mind. I have a picture which... Is it stuck there? No, I don't know, I don't see it. Never mind. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. Can you, does this work? No, it doesn't. Never mind. No, I, I didn't bring it. It's just my impossible triangle. <laughs> and so you can see there is uh, an element of that in this picture because there's a fourth mystery, if you like. It's not just three mysteries, but the fourth mystery is how on earth you can have a system where each one seems to come from the one before and yet it's a consistent picture. So I try to show it's deliberately drawn a bit like that impossible triangle so that uh, you can see that the whole thing, I there's something mysterious about how that can be. Okay, I quite like to present mysteries. I should say, sometimes people say, well, Popper already had three worlds. He did indeed, but one of his worlds was quite different. It was the world of culture. I forget which one of these he dispensed with in order to fit that in the picture. But they were sort of sequential, one after the other. So it's quite a different picture from this. I just thought I would mention that. Okay, now, this picture also involves several, several of my own prejudices, points of view, I don't know what you'd say, um, because it's drawn in that way rather than in a way like this. You see, I have to have this the right way up, just so it's, is that the right way up? I think that way is, isn't it? So it's, these are the same worlds, but I'm not necessarily suggesting that th what happens in each world is completely determined by what happens in the previous one. So the physical world, for example, okay, we know these wonderful laws of physics, but maybe there are some other things going on which are not mathematical and come from somewhere else. Okay, perhaps this does not encompass the whole of this world. Likewise, maybe there are things in mentality which don't come about from the physical world. They can come from somewhere else. They're, they're not products of the physical brains that we have that there is something outside of all that, and this is not an uncommon view amongst people, so that, that does not encompass the whole of this world. And maybe there are things in mathematics which are inaccessible to us in principle. Okay, there are a lot of things which are inaccessible in practice, not just difficult mathematics, but things which are just very complicated. You might say, how about the product of two numbers which would you know, take about a year to write down each, and what's the answer to the product of them? Well. That might be too much even for current computers. And so you might say that's inaccessible. That's accessible to us in principle, because we know what we're doing. That's not what I mean, something that's too complicated just because it's complicated. OK, just something which is in principle inaccessible to us, that might be true too. And some people have that view in mathematics. So that's, these are all possibilities. But nevertheless, the picture that I like to hold is the one which I'm showing here, that each of these worlds is encompassed, except it's not that picture, is it? It's not that one either, it's this one. That, here we go, it's that way up. Um, where somehow each world, a little bit of it, does encompass the entire of the other world. Okay, so that's my own prejudice or viewpoint or whatever you like to say. Leave it there, thanks. Now, Sometimes people talk about Platonic world, and they mean not just mathematics having this reality, but they're the other Platonic values. values. Um, truth is what I've basically been talking about. Truth in this more, most refined sense, mathematical truth, but then it applies to other things as well. Truth, and then there's beauty, and there's morality. That's the good, and I think Plato thought that was the most important one. Well, that has to do something with this world, so I've drawn it as though Morality encompasses consciousness too, so some does seem to depend whether something is good or bad does depend upon whether the thing that it involves is conscious or not. That's certainly very important, so I'm drawn it as though it encompasses that. And then there's this ax axis of 
how we understand physical laws, and certainly the role of beauty is very important in trying to understand how physics works and that sort of thing. And so there's some, something to do with encompassing both these worlds. So I thought I'd just draw a picture like that for fun. So I'll keep that one on the top probably. Why don't I keep it there in case I come back to it. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to say something about these worlds which has to do, I mean I could have talked about lots of topics here, but the one in particular which seems to have something to do with all of them at once. And so I thought that was rather appropriate. And this has to do with, well first of all, the laws of physics as we currently understand them, we can put on a computer. In fact, this wonderful recent observation of apparently uh, black holes spiraling into each other that was observed in, uh, in the LIGO system. And um, this depends upon very, very detailed calculations performed by people over many period, a long period of time to work out what general relativity says happens when black holes spiral into each other. And this is very complicated uh, calculational procedure. So you can put that kind of process on a computer. Well, to, to apply, you can put Newtonian physics on a computer, you can put Maxwell's equations on a computer, you can put the Schrodinger equation on a computer. But I'm going to have a point of view which I say there is something going on. You see, the point of view maybe is that all physics you see, this picture is, is computable physics. I'm going to say something about what's computable and what's not computable. That's an important issue here. But maybe the mathematical world of computable physics encompasses all the laws of physics. Or maybe it doesn't. And what I'm going to try and say, in a certain sense, is that it encompasses a lot of what we do in physics, but there's a part of it, and it's that part which has to do with mentality, which is not encompassed by computational mathematics. And to, to make the point that there are things which are not computable in mathematics, I'll, I'll make that point later on. So that's an important part of what I want to say, that there are things in mathematics which you cannot get the answer putting it on a computer. We know that. Um, it's not very well known if you're not a mathematician or a mathematical logician, but there certainly are such things. So it's a, it's a reasonable question to ask, you know, whether the laws that we, not just the laws we know, but maybe laws we don't yet know, which are not computable. And that's a question which I want to consider later on. Let me put this down here. I might need to look at it again. Okay. Now where are we? Okay, now let's talk about this issue of computability. And it all comes down to a question, let me put this like this. You see, people often say, we think about computable or not computable, and they're talking about complicated things, but they're finite. You know, uh, the game of Go, you can put it on a computer and it seems to do pretty well, at beating even the world champion and so on. And the game of chess, but then you can present arguments that maybe even these good chess playing computers don't have the faintest idea what they're doing. And I. I I haven't got, I've got an example which explains that, but let me do not do that here. The main argument about things that computers can't do comes from things which are infinite. Now you see, people often think, oh, well, you can't really think about the infinite. That's completely wrong. You certainly can. And, for example, I can make a statement about infinite numbers that I don't think, infinite number of things that I don't think people would um, quibble about. If you take two numbers, and when I say a number, I mean a natural number, uh, what I mean is a number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Sometimes mathematicians don't include 0. I'm including 0 as a natural number. A non-negative whole number is a natural number to me. And, um, okay, um, suppose you have two even numbers and you add them together, then you get another even number. That's a statement about an infinite number of things. And you don't need to you know, think too much about infinity. If you add an even number to an odd number, you always get an odd number. That's a statement about an infinite number of things, which is not so hard to grasp. There are lots of much more complicated statements like this, which are very hard to grasp. But nevertheless, we can think about the infinite. And there's a way we learn at school, which is very familiar, which is called induction. 
If you have a proposition dependent on the number n, this is a natural number, one way of establishing that this proposition is true for all n is first of all to, s to show that it's true for zero, and secondly, to show that if it's true for some number n, then it's true for n plus one. That's ordinary mathematical induction. Two finite things that you can show. This establishes p of n for all numbers. That's the statement about an infinite number of things, and we can think about infinity in that sense. Okay, there are some much more obscure infinities that mathematicians talk about. I'm not going to worry about them here. Just, this is big enough for me. Okay, it's what's called first order piano arithmetic, uh, piano uh, logic, first order logic. If you combine this induction with the ordinary rules of logic, and that's the system. Okay, now, the next point I want to make is this famous theorem of Kurt Gödel. And I'm going to give it in the form due to Alan Turing, basically, which is, suppose you have a set of rules. These are rules which you could put on a computer. And these rules are things which, for once you've gone through, chug, 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 you, you, you feed in at the beginning, is this certain statement true or not? Example might have been the famous uh, Fermat's Last Theorem that Andrew Wiles was able to show is true. There's a th an even simpler one to state, which is the Goldbach conjecture, that every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. Never been proved. There's a slight variant of that which has been proved, but that one has never been proved. But the statements of that kind statement about an infinite number of things, is it true or not? And a way you might prove that is to have a system of rules R which you could put on a computer. And the computer chugs away, and if it comes out with an answer that says yes, then it's true. If it comes out with the answer no, then it's false. If it keeps on chugging forever, you don't know. Okay. Now that's, what, that's the way these algorithms work. Now the important thing is how do you know to trust R. You say, well, you have to look at the rules. And you say, well, let's look at the first one. So, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Second one, yeah, I can understand that one. Third one, hmm, I'm not sure. Um, ah, yeah, it's okay. And you go through them all, and if you convince yourself that everything, if it's followed correctly by the computer, and it comes up with the answer yes, then it's a convincing proof that it is actually true. Now, suppose you have that belief that this system R is not a load of nonsense. It really does, if it says yes, the statement you fed in, uh, the question that you've asked it, if it says yes, it's true, then you believe it because you've checked these procedures and they convince you it's right. Now, what Gödel does, it's an amazing thing. I learned about this when I was a, uh, in my first year, I think it was, a graduate student in Cambridge, and then I went to a course on mathematical logic, and I'd heard that Gödel's theorem seemed to prove things that you seems to show there are statements you can't prove. I didn't like that idea. What he showed is not that. What it shows is that if you've got a particular system R, which you regarded as your proof systems, then Gödel constructs a statement G of R. I could do that in detail, but I haven't got a time to show. It's not that hard to show using Turing's, Turing's ideas. Um, if you've got a what Gödel shows, there's a statement G of R, which the way it's constructed and what it means you can see that G of R is actually true, but that it is not derivable by these rules. See, it's not unprovable, because you only set settled on this particular set of rules as what you're regarding a set of proof procedures. And you've convinced yourself that if the system says, yes, it's true, then you believe it is true. But then the way that Gödel constructs a statement, you can say, yeah, that one's true too. But it's true on the basis of your trust in the system, not by using the system. By using the system, you can't get it. But by understanding what the system actually means and why you trust it to be reliable, tells you that G of R is true too. So if you sense, that's a proof. It's just as good a proof as anything you use deriving R. It's not unprovable. It's unprovable using R, but it's not unprovable in absolute sense because you can see it's true on the same basis of your trust that R only gives you truths. 
I found this absolutely stunning when I heard that. And it kind of shifted my viewpoint in an important way. Now, I think it's useful at this stage to give you an example of a Gödel theorem. See, people often say that these things are so obscure that you're never going to be interested in them. Well, of course, you are in principle interested in them because if they're not provable by means of a certain set of rules, that's interesting. That's mathematically interesting. But let me give you something else which is a little bit more specific. It's a nice example which is not nice because it's easy to explain to people who don't perhaps know a great deal of mathematics. All you have to know, well, you know, have to know what a natural number is. Let's take an example to explain it. I'm going to choose the number 1077. And what I'm going to do first is to write it in a binary form. Now, people are familiar with that. What it means is that each of these ones in this binary expansion stands for a power of two. And the, the powers go up as you go up the, to the left. And so this is telling you it's a sum of these powers of two on the right. I'm afraid my eyesight isn't good enough to see those numbers. I hope you can. Anyway, those are the powers of two, which when add distinct powers of two, which added together give you 1,077. And any natural number will have such an expansion. Now, I... You first of all, you look at this and you say, well, that's all very interesting, but you've got some exponents there which are not written in this way. So you say, okay, well, there's a 10 there. You say, okay, let's write that as a power of 2. That's 8 plus 2. And I'm writing all the indices that way. But I'm still not finished because I've got 8. And 8 is 2 to the 3, etc. So, well, anyway, you can keep on going, going up and up and up in the powers until everything is written in terms of powers of 2. Now, what I'm going to do, tell you, is this is the theorem due to Goodstein, proved in, I think, 1945 or something. Very remarkable result. I'll explain what it is. Once you've written your number in this form, I want to do two things to it. First of all, is to look at all those twos and replace them by threes. So that's the base. That's operation A. Replace the twos by threes. Okay, the number has got much, much bigger than it was <coughs> before. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. That's operation A. Operation is B is subtract 1. Okay, that little one at the end comes off. The number hasn't changed much. And then operation A again, replace all the threes by fours. Operation B, subtract 1. It's a little more complicated now because there isn't a handy one sitting at the end. So it's like subtracting 1 from 1,000 and getting 999. But this is in base 4. So you've got these coefficients, the threes there, which are so less than 4, but you allow them. But the 4, everything else is in terms of the, p the powers are with 4s in them. And you just go on A, B, A, B, A, B, like that. The 5, you're going to the 5s, and so on. Now, what happens to these numbers? Well, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the, the you see, I put written down roughly, the green ones, what is it, 10 to the 40 or something? I can't see anything, but you can probably see it better than I can even though there's a splodge at the end there. I'm sorry about that. I'll come to that in a minute. Okay, you go on. The numbers get huger and huger and huger. Subtracting one doesn't make a difference. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And they finally end up with zero. This is absolutely stunning. This is Goodstein's theorem. Now, it's been proved by Paris and Kirby that it's true. Well, Goodstein knew it was true. I'll come to that in a minute. It cannot be proved by mathematical induction. It's a Gödel type theorem. It's a theorem which cannot be proved by the ordinary mathematical induction. How do we know it's true? Well, I can tell you. Uh, you have to know a little bit of mathematics that you may not necessarily know here. I'll only give it this for the experts. What you do is you cover up all the, the, uh, the powers, of the, the, the bases, and then operation A doesn't do a damn thing. The thing that's blocked ov off is the first of Cantor's ordinal number, infinite ordinal numbers called omega. And the first operation does nothing. The operation B subtracts 1. It gives you a smaller ordinal. And there's a theorem that if you take a reducing set of ordinals, it's got to end up with 0. Of course, that's a little bit hard to see. If you want to see a little get more insight into this, I would try it first with 3. That comes down pretty fast. Then try it with 4. I would not recommend you're using your laptop. I would not recommend you're using a mainframe. I would not recommend using any computer in the world. I would recommend you take a piece of 
pencil and a piece of paper and fiddle around with it for a bit and ultimately you can probably convince yourself that with four it really will eventually come down and go to zero. So this is a, the hare and the tortoise to beat all hares and tortoises. The tortoise wins. It takes an age for the tortoise to win, but it does win. Okay, it's a lovely example, um, but okay. What's the point here that I'm trying to make? Well, it's possible to see that that comes down. But now you see, what I'm trying to say is that the way we understand things in mathematics, and I would say more generally than mathematics, but you say, people, well, why, why don't you talk about other aspects of consciousness? Well, I don't only because mathematics and mathematical understanding is something which I believe one can see is not computational. And that's a very specific case, and if you can show that's not computational, that opens the floodgates. Other ways of thinking, all sorts of them, I believe, are not the product of a computation. And you can use the Gödel argument to show that you can see beyond it, whatever it is. But then there's a little catch, you say. Well, the Gödel argument only works if you know what that algorithm is. Now, I've gone through in my book, Shadows of the Mind, to talk about these things in a very complicated way. I think it doesn't have to be that complicated. Any algorithm which is powerful enough to see that the Goodstein theorem is true, or even with just the number four, any algorithm which can do that, how did it come about? If it's sitting in our heads, we may not know it, but it's in our heads. Well, how did it come about? Well, natural selection, sure. Okay, well, here is a little cartoon I've made, I think. It doesn't matter which way around it is here, because there are no letters, but let's put it that way around. I'm trying to show that being a mathematician is not a selective advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably still true, but I'm trying to point out that it was probably true for our remote ancestors. Now you see here, we have, here's the mathematician in the foreground, and you can see he's about to be devoured by the saber-toothed tiger. He's lost in his proving, it. there's a little joke about what their theorem is, but I won't go into that now. He's about to be devoured by the saber-toothed tiger, so, so his, his selective uh, advantage into mathematics is pretty negative. What about his colleagues over here, his cousins and so on? Well, they're doing useful things like building mammoth traps, um, building shelters, uh, domesticating animals, growing crops, all these things. They've used their understanding in a general way to develop these skills. Just mathematics, no. But what the point I'm trying to make is that to have us an algorithm in our heads which can see that the number four comes down, how could that possibly have come about by natural selection? One that we don't understand what it is. There's no way, in fact, far as I can see. It's not a result of natural selection. An algorithm like that cannot be. Maybe a general procedure for understanding, yes. But I'm trying to say, that from this argument, that it's not an algorithm. That's the point. And the fact that you can have things which are not algorithmic is the point I'm trying to make. I guess I should put this up here, which is just what I'm trying to say, that um, mathematics, being a mathematician itself, is not a selective answer. We have an algorithm for doing mathematics. That's not the point. But having a general procedure of some sort, which cannot be an algorithm, for understanding things, sure, that was what was selected for. That's the point I'm trying to make there. But how it can be something non-computable is a question people worry about. Well, let me give you a specific example of something non-computable. It's something we know is. It's a nice example because, again, it's something easy to explain to people. I'm going to talk about things called polyominoes. These are made of equal squares glued together along their edges. So you take a number of these squares and you make a shape. There's one shape, there's another shape. And the question is, can you use that shape to tile the plane? The infinite plane, can you cover the whole plane without any overlaps or gaps? And I've, for these two particular ones, I've shown a way to do it, so that's fine. Maybe you're going to need two shapes. You see, here's an example where each one of those individually, you go away and you get a gap and it doesn't work. If you just take the F-shaped one, that doesn't work either. How if you've got the both of them together, sure, you can do it. So this is the kind of problem I'm talking about. Here's another example, just a single shape, and it's a little complicated to see how it works. 
But yes, it, you can cover the plane. What about the general question? Could you have a computer which will give you the answer yes or no, depending on whether the shapes in the set will tile a plane? Well, here's a nice example, which I made up. I would like someone to try it on a computer. It would be rather nice. Try these shapes, put it on the computer, try to cover as big a region as you can. I wonder whether it could get one this big. I would be interested to know. If it can, I'll take one which is twice as big and give it back to the computer. <laughs> I know how to do it, but it's not any algorithm which I know of which would give it. I happen to know it's true for a particular reason. You, those of you now really might say, well, look it up all my papers and see if you can find how to do it. You could do it that way, but you'd have to find the right paper, and I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the kind of algorithm we're talking about. How do you actually decide whether a set of shapes like this will tie the plane or not? Well, it's pr been proved, this is the theorem, that there is no algorithm which will answer yes or no to this problem. And that's a proved mathematical statement. There is no computational algorithm. If it was a repeating pattern, like the ones I just showed you originally, yes, you could get an algorithm for that, to say, yes, is there a repeating algorithm or is there not? But this is not one. This is a non-repeating pattern. Okay. Now that's just mathematics. Now what I want to say here is how about the physical world? Because I'm trying to say, the argument is, if beings like ourselves can somehow have this quality of understanding, which I regard as a, a manifestation of consciousness, it's a very particular manifestation, and there are lots of others, it's the only one I can see clearly how to say something about what can be going on in a conscious mind, that a conscious mind um, has to be dependent on some non-computable things in the world out there. So I'm saying yeah, out there in the world there is something non-computable. What is it? Well, we know from, for example, the LIGO things, these general relativity, they can do very, very good calculations and see what happens on black holes spiraling into each other. Okay, there's a little problem about accuracy and how close can you get, and you're dependent on the continuum rather than discreteness and so on. But I don't think that's important. It's a question which might one might raise, but I don't think it's important. General relativity you can put on a computer, no Newtonian physics you can put on a computer, Maxwell's equations. Quantum mechanics, what about that? Well, you can put the Schrodinger equation on a computer. It's a bit difficult because you have to put lots and lots of parameters in and so on. But yeah, you could put it on a computer too. So where's the catch? Well, the catch has to do with this. This is a picture I drew. Um, I was asked to give a lecture in Erdense in Denmark because the, I can't remember, was it the bicentenary of Hans Christian Andersen was coming up and they asked me to give a talk. And I thought, what on earth are they asking me for? I'm not an expert on fairy tales, I hope. That's not what I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but then I thought, yes, I did write this book called The Emperor's New Mind, which was a play on the Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, I didn't want to use that, I had to think of another one. So I thought of the uh, Little Mermaid because I was worrying about the foundations of quantum mechanics and I thought she illustrated that quite well. In, in, in my lecture in, in Edinburgh, I did talk about, uh, you people know about Schrodinger's cat, well I had a Schrodinger's mermaid which fitted in rather well into the story because the, the sun comes up, you see she's a, it, the first ray of light that hits the mermaid and, and she gets killed. So I thought, well, let's look at a little mirror in between so that the photon gets reflected up into the sky. Well, that's all right, then she's not killed. But suppose that mirror is a half-silvered mirror or a beam splitter. Then the photon is split in the two ways, so she's half dead and half alive. And so she's, she's a Schrodinger's mermaid. But that, this is not what the point I'm making here. It's a different one. So what point am I making here? Well, you see, the top part of this picture represents classical physics where you've got things, or discrete things, separate from each other, behaving according to a sort of Newtonian kind of way, and yeah, that's classical physics. The top bottom part represents the quantum world with all these strange, unfamiliar creatures creeping around down there, all tangled up with seaweed and entanglements and things like that. And what's the mermaid doing? Well, the mermaid spans the two. Her tail, of course, is in the sea, and the rest of her is up on the top. And she represents, you see here, there's a quantum world that represents you, unitary evolution. Classical world is C, the classical <coughs> world. And she represents R, the reduction of the quantum state. You see, quantum theory consists of two parts. 
One is the Schrodinger equation, which evol evolves away, chugs away, tells you what the state does, and then you make a measurement, and it does something quite different. And it's a huge puzzle. People regard it as a, a problem of understanding quantum mechanics or interpreting quantum mechanics or something. My view is different. My view, in accordance with Schrodinger's view and in Einstein's view and a little less familiarly known, Dirac's view, quantum mechanics is a provisional theory. And we need a better theory which tells us when things become in some sense macroscopic and then start to behave according to classical physics. And it's not coming from quantum mechanics that we understand it. There's something new we need. And the new thing is this thing that the mermaid represents. Not only does she feel both worlds, but she is mysterious. And there is something new about physics which we need to know which I represent by the letter R, that's the reduction of the quantum state. Can somebody tell me how little time I've got left? Probably negative by now. How much? About 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, that's, I mean, that's so loads. I see, you know, I'll see what I can do. Yes, well look, you see, I, I, I only sketch it. My point of view, you see people often talk about combining general relativity with quantum mechanics, they talk about quantum gravity. May say, I think I made a big mistake in my book, The Emperor's New Mind, calling what I mean correct quantum gravity. I think that's a bad terminology. It's not quantum gravity. It's gravitational quantum mechanics. See, quantum gravity is looking at how quantum mechanics affects space-time structure. And in order to test this experimentally, you probably need an accelerator the size of the solar system to see the get energies high enough to probe the tiny little distances which are 10 to the, f whatever it is, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the photon, the proton. So that's, that's a, a real challenge. But the other way around, how does general relativity affect quantum mechanics? Well, you see, I, I don't know if I need to trouble you. This is a picture of quantum mechanics, if you want. I, perhaps I should say this. It's just a rapid description. Here we have a, so yeah, it's a machine which is ejecting photons and two detectors, and this is a, a beam splitter, a half silver mirror. The photon is either here or it's detected there. But if I put two of them and I go through an interferometer, then you find it's always detected here and never here. This illustrates the particle-like behavior of photons, this the wave-like, and you have this thing about superposition. That's the key point. In quantum mechanics, if you have a thing A, which might happen, that's the photon going one way, B, which might happen going the other way, then you've got to consider a state which involves both at once, and that's the way you get it coming out just one way, and that's the way it works. And you have these complex numbers and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into that here because there is a, a limit on time. It's all great fun and important, and that's quantum mechanics. But the thing is, it's got two procedures. One is U, unitary evolution, that was under the sea in the mermaid picture. That is the evolution of the state, which is the Schrodinger equation. It preserves these superpositions. The superpositions persist. And then there's R, which is what happens somehow when a measurement is made and it flops over to one or the other. And that's the big mystery. Why do you have these two incompatible procedures in standard quantum mechanics? Okay, what I'm trying to say is that this is something which maybe we can gain some insights into if we look at the foundation, not of the quantum mechanics, but of general relativity. This goes back to Galileo, and here we imagine him, probably didn't do it, but it doesn't matter, a big rock and a little rock from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and they drop together. He say, okay, we know about air resistance, that one was a feather and so on, he, he knew about all that stuff. It's not that, the big rocks and the little rocks will fall together, and here is a picture of a little insect sitting on the big rock, and as far as the insect's concerned, there is, during the falling, there is no gravitational field. And we know that now in terms of astronauts floating in space. The Earth is right there. The astronaut doesn't care about the Earth particularly. Well, it's nice to look at, but <laughs> the Earth's gravitational field is cancelled out by the motion of the astronaut. It's as though there was no gravity. Okay. That's the way general relativity works. Now, what about trying to put them together? And this is where you do start to run into problems. And here I have a little bit of a thought experiment. I'm going to imagine that we do a ex quantum experiment on a tabletop. And it's a very delicate quantum experiment where we want to take into consideration the Earth's gravitational field. 
Now, how do you do it? Most quantum mechanics people would say, there's the obvious, we just put a term in the Hamiltonian, forget what that means, but it doesn't matter, a term in the Hamiltonian to represent the gravitational potential, chug away in the normal procedure and you get your answer. Okay, that's standard quantum mechanics. But then Einstein comes along and says, no, 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 you shouldn't do it that way. The gravitational field is not a force. You shouldn't put another term in the Hamiltonian like that. You, what you should do is to consider that you have a freely falling frame, you imagine your experiment done in that frame, and then you transform back. Okay, we'll do it. That's the Einstein. first one is the Newtonian perspective, the second is the Einsteinian perspective, and you do it carefully. And you see there's not much difference, the only difference is what's called a phase factor. The two wave functions, the two state vectors, are almost the same in the two procedures. They only differ by, differ by this phase factor thing, which if you ask a quantum mechanics person, they'll say, oh, well, it doesn't matter, phase factor doesn't matter, hoot, it's just the same. It's not quite the same, you look carefully at the phase factor and you see there's a T cubed in there, T is the time. That's bad news because this means that the two systems are in a, what's called different quantum field theory vacuum. That's a technical point which I don't want to elaborate upon, but technically speaking, that these are different quantum mechanical systems. Doesn't matter, because you can choose one or the other, as long as you stick to it, you get the same answer. Now, here's the problem. Suppose it's not the Earth's field you're worrying about, but you've got a lump of thing sitting as part of your apparatus, and that is put into a superposition of being here and here, and now you are in trouble, because the, using the Einsteinian perspective, you get one vacuum for one, and you get the other vacuum for the other, and the rule is thou shalt not make superpositions in different, different vacua. That's not allowed. So you're stuck. You really can't do it in accordance with the Einsteinian perspective. Okay, we shouldn't stop there, yeah. just say you're stuck. So you don't stop there. And what you do is you look, look a little bit more carefully and see how big the problem is. Well, this is just another picture, so giving the same thing as I said before. You see how big the problem is? I'm not going to labor on this because I think I want to just move forward, and you can measure the size of the problem. And the size of the problem is a sort of energy uncertainty in the, in the whole situation. And an energy uncertainty, when you think back about Heisenberg, and you say, what's an uncertainty relation in Heisenberg? If you've got an energy uncertainty, that's related to a time uncertainty. And it's relevant to particles which have a decay. You say, decay into one thing or the other, and the decay in a certain lifetime the reciprocal of that lifetime gives you an uncertainty in the energy of the system initially. That's well established, well understood quantum mechanics. But now I'm using it in a strange form. The lump being in one location or in the other, this is just a specific calculation one does, it can be here and here at the same time. And what I'm saying is that there's certain energy uncertainty in, in this thing which you get from the argument I was just talking about, which I'm calling EG. And this EG tells you the reciprocal of it tells you a lifetime of this superposition. <coughs> what do I mean by lifetime? It decays into one or the other. So rather than remaining in a superposition, so the dead cat and the live cat being dead and alive at the same time, that system decays into a dead cat or a live cat in a time that you can calculate using this formula. For a cat, it will be a ridiculously tiny fraction of a second, we boom, one or the other. For a lump, it depends on how big the lump is. And this is the sort of formula you get. This is just a Newtonian calculation which I don't have time to go into but I thought I'd just show you to show those real calculations there. Um, now here's a way of interpreting it which I rather like. You see this is a space-time picture. You have to get used to the idea. Of course to have a space-time picture you've got to throw away a few dimensions. So I've thrown away two space dimensions. Time is going up this way. Space is going along this way. There should really be three dimensions this way. And this is a little bump in the space-time. The bump is due to the, uh, the, the lump being in one location. Now it evolves, so the lump goes two ways, the space-time starts to bifurcate, and then you try and estimate is how bad is this bifurcation. So you do an integral about over this region. If it's small spatially, then it can be a long time temporally. If it's, l if it's large spatially, then it's a short time. And that gives you a formula which is a formula which I use here. EG is the energy uncertainty and the time scale hi over here is the time this takes to reduce. Okay, there's some serious calculations in that and there are experiments 
which have been going on for a while and others which are starting to go on. And I think it could well be that in the next few years we'll have an answer to this. It's uh, still not known. It's just sort of on the borderline of what one can test with current technology. It's quite unlike testing the quantum effects, how quantum effect affects gravity, that's quantum gravity in the normal sense, that's way off the picture. But how gravity might affect quantum mechanics, that's just about what people can do in experiments. And yet there, there is no answer to that question. Anyway, I should go back to my picture which I just showed you and try to find a transparency which has almost certainly disappeared. But let me go back to this picture. It's disappeared because it's smaller, my other ones. And my eyesight, can you see anything yeah, here? Which one? A little tiny one. <laughs> There's only one ti little tiny one. It's probably not there. It's probably vanished and I've got it. Don't look any further. Here it is. This is the picture. So what I'm saying is that there is a choice. The universe decides to do one or the other. Now in current quantum mechanics, that decision is random. Now what I'm trying to say is that there's something more to this decision. That it's non-computable and it's connected with our conscious understanding. So this scheme, which I've developed sort of with Stuart Hameroff, who has an idea of how it might work in the brain, build, bringing in things called microtubules, I'm not talking about that here. It could be microtubules, it could be things like clathrins or other substances, it could be to do with nuclear spins, it could be to do with all these things. But something subtle going on in the brain which maintains a quantum superposition for so long that when it reduces to one or the other, well, you see, what the idea is that when you, this reduction happens, that's accompanied, in our theory, by a moment of proto-consciousness. So there, there is a, each time this reduction takes place, it's going off in the air all the time, everywhere, but in a way which is incoherent. And so those elements of proto-consciousness are taking place when there's enough mass movement to reduce the state, but it's incoherent. If somehow you could gather it all together in a way which makes sense, then that's what we consider consciousness comes about. So consciousness in this view is somehow orchestrated, OR stands for this reduction, objective reduction of the state, that's the OR taking place here, objective reduction. It's a nice acronym because OR means or, one or the other. So that one or the other happens, not just the superposition, it becomes one or the other. And it does it in a time scale you can calculate from the formula I gave before, but how you apply that in the brain is a great problem. But maybe there are things which preserve themselves coherently for long enough so that when this happens, it can be interpreted in some way as a conscious experience. Anyway, that's the idea. And it does, as I say, relate the three different mysteries. We've had the, um, the mysteries, as I say, of the relationships between the three worlds. And uh, I started off with this mystery, how we understand mathematics. Then there was this mystery about how the mathematics relates to the operation of the physical world. And then what does that have to do with conscious experience? So I rather thought this an example was a good one to present here because it does bring this picture as a whole into perspective and I hope it's helpful. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Professor Penrose. That was really fascinating. Um, we're, we have time for, for some questions. There is going to be plenty of time for discussion, I should have said, in a, in a later session this afternoon. So you have plenty of time, hopefully, to, to ask further questions of P Professor Penrose. But if we can maybe just um, uh, get a couple of things to, um, questions to kick things off. Okay. Yes, in the back here. I hope I didn't say no way. I, I was saying that there is a chance within the next years. Now, I think if you're looking at the effects of gravity on quantum mechanics, not as quantum mechanics on gravity, that's hopeless. But gravity on quantum mechanics, I would expect within the next few years, well, there's, I should say there's an experiment that one of your countrymen, this is uh, Dick Baumester, who's been working on a particular way of looking for state reduction for, I don't know, quite a long time now, and he hasn't got an answer yet, 
according to one of his predictions, it might be within the next couple of years. I hope his predictions are consistent. But I, that's a very nice way of looking at it, and maybe he will have an answer. The other possibility that I know of, which is quite promising, is using Bose-Einstein condensates. And I have some colleagues, Yvette Fuentes and her group there in, in Nottingham, have a program for using Bose-Einstein condensates, which is sort of on the margin of what one might see. So I would say, no, not out of the question. We might see it in the next five years, say. Other questions? Peter. I was just wondering, you were talking about um, this, this protonsius um, part. Yes. You said it has to be long, it has to exist long enough. Yes. And so what time scale are we talking about? <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, I, I think Stuart has a little bit of a different view from me. I mean, he's thinking of very rapid time scales. The problem is that you need to get a big enough superposition to persist for a long time. And I was always impressed by these experiments that Libet had done, where you seem to have time, li sort of half a second seems to be quite an important length of time for, con that's long. How's that going to work in a biological scenario? Yes. Oh, sure. No, it's got to be very something very subtle. No. Well, I think, you see, first of all, people complain, well, this is ridiculous, it's way outside. And I wrote The Emperor's New Mind, thinking it was ridiculous, but I would, you know, I didn't know anything about <laughs> neurophysiology. I learned a bit during the writing of the book, and I hoped that I would have enough by the time I got to the end of the book, I could see possibly where there could be anything here. I didn't. <laughs> so there was no, nothing in what I learned about neurophysiology. But then I got a letter from Stuart Hameroff, and he said, well, you may not realize there are these microtubules which play an important role, according to him, in consciousness. And this is a good line, because one of the great clues one has about consciousness is not to see what it does and so on, but what happens when you turn it off. So he's, his, his job is basically, his day job or whatever you call it, I'm sure it's in the night sometimes, is to put people asleep reversibly. He doesn't like me calling it asleep because it's a different kind of state. Under a general anesthetic, and then you've got to be able to wake them up again. Now, what chemicals, what substances do this? And it's intriguing because they're all completely different. And what does it do? And he claims, and I think there's some evidence for this, that these substances, these general anesthetic substances, affect the microtubules. And they have a paper not so long ago in Nature which seems to present a good case for that. I don't think well, it's clear at the moment. I suspect it's not just microtubules. There are other structures, there are these clathrins which inhabit the... Uh, synapses and which it's the, the beautiful symmetry you get because symmetry is a great important thing when you have a symmetry this may mean that you have a big gap between there's this Jan Teller effect which you can have lots going on in the ground state and shielded from what goes up there I think that's in promising another possibly promising area is in uh, nuclear spins that's an idea due to to Ma, um, uh, Fisher uh, Matthew Fisher and I think that's promising too for long-term preservation of quantum states, it maybe you have to do it in, in nuclear spins. But still, you need to say for the quantum state, you need this long-term cohesion. Yes, yes. But in a biological system, where we have, you know, there's a room temperature. Oh, sure. It's all wet. And, you know, oh, sure. Of, of no, you have to have certain, you need certain degrees of freedom which are protected from this environmental degree. I know, it's absolutely crucial. I completely agree. And it's a big challenge. But you can't just use an argument and say, well, look, there's this environment around and so on. Because biological systems are very complicated and, and we now know in photosynthesis you do have um, subtle quantum effects which are uh, part of the process. And very likely in the next several years we will find other things going on. And the, it's, it's, I don't think we see any clear evidence for it at the moment. But the argument is sort of indirect that there has to be, in my view, something which probes this boundary between the quantum and classical level, which is actually reached in a conscious brain. I mean, that's a, an, a, a really uh, a, an extraordinary claim to make, I agree. But, th but it's telling us there's a lot more subtle things going on in the physical operation of the brain than we know at the moment. Okay, I think we have time for one last question in the back there. Have, would they uh, measure different states or would they 
You mean different, different brains perceiving the same world? Yeah, but you see, what I'm trying to say is it's not, you see, I think so much of quantum mechanics is phrased in such a way as there's a somehow mysterious observer who looks at things. <laughs> but an observer is a physical system in practice, and that physical system is itself following whatever laws the thing it's observing follow. So something along the level, along this chain, and this is von Neumann chain, if you like, something along that chain something else happens, and the reduction of the state happens. Now, whether that happens in our physical bodies, which maybe sometimes does, because if you're looking at something and it's very dark and you've got much better eyes than I do, and you can see something which requires only a few individual photons, okay, maybe the reduction is happening in the optic nerve or something. But usually, it's happened long before. I mean, Schrodinger's cat, Sure, the cat's dead or alive, and forget about the cat's consciousness. The cat's dead or alive long before any, anybody comes and opens the box in this scheme. So everybody will get the same answer. Somebody may have secretly opened the box and closed it again, and somebody comes along and opens it. The thing's happened way before the first person does. So there's nothing subjective. I mean, OR is done deliberate with the O in there. It's subjective. That it's happening in the world, and it's not to do with observers. It's happening... Okay, an observer is a, is a physical system and it will involve some sort of mass displacement somewhere along the system which goes one way or the other. And when that happens, the state, well, it's probably already done it before an observer comes along because it's, uh, you have to be very careful and have your system which is shielded from the... This is what these experiments, the Biomester 1 and other VEC experiments which might go on, you've got to make sure it's shielded from the outside world and so there's no environmental decoherence, so you keep it as well as you can, and does it nevertheless still objectively do one thing or the other before nobody has anybody has looked at it? And so it's a bit subtle to see if it's done that or not, but you know, experiments can tell us these things. So that's the idea. It's not to do with an observer at all, right? it's misleading. Quantum mechanics is phrased in terms of observers, but it's really, in this point of view, it should be phrased in terms of an objective reduction of the state which has nothing to do with anybody coming in looking at it. It has to do with it, it does it itself. I mean, maybe in certain very specific circumstances, maybe with individual photons, that it would be to do with what happens in, in your eye or the optic nerve or something or other. But that's a very special circumstance and usually it's happened long before certainly any human observer has, has, has looked at it. Okay, one, one more, yeah. That one? Yes. I would like to ask a very general question. Uh, yes. So this is this point that you are drawing these pictures and you have mentioned evolution. Yes. <laughs> but if I now try to put this whole picture in evolution, inside the whole thing of evolution. Mm, very interesting. Uh, and then ask questions like, oh, I can prove that you can never prove this, or something like you would state. Mm. Then that is always in these set of rules. But we know sometimes within a given set of rules, I cannot prove something. I can complete the set of rules or extend the set of rules. Maybe then you can get different answers depending on how you have extended this set of rules. Yeah. Then uh, I would uh, call evolution of mathematics in some sense. Well, that's a so the very different. <laughs> of mathematics, which yes. in some sense is an analogy of the, the layers of the material universe. Mm. Yeah. allow for more complicated storage of information and entropy will increase and all that kind of stuff. And so the same may be true for the mental world. So I would like to think or rethink your proposals in terms of uh, the incompleteness, the incompleteness of everything. And so the incompleteness of mathematics in the sense of incompleteness theorems and the incompleteness of a physical uh, universe which we cannot Well, and, and so this, this seems to me uh, opening, an, an opening that is very hard to close with no both theorems. I mean, we have lived with no both theorems all the time, and all the time there's a way around them, or we find another way of formulating it, or we find that it was not quite the way we want to ask the question. 
Well, you raise a very interesting question. It's a, a very different viewpoint from mine when you talk about mathematics. Because particularly in the Gödel example, I mean, you have other theorems in logic where you say, well, you could do this or you could do this, which you check, well, is it if it's consistent originally, then you know it's still consistent, whichever one you take. But the point is that in the Gödel thing, it's clear which one you take, because if you know what the system means, and it's important to know what it means, you will know which one to take. Because if you take the other one, it's changing your viewpoint. I mean, it's you thought you were talking about the quantifiers mean what you thought you meant, and the actual numbers mean what you thought they meant. They want some system, a different kind of system, for which the negative of the, the, con the inverse, what do you say, the negation of the Gödel statement is adjoined to your system. But you see, if you look at the meaning of these things and the system you meant to be talking about, it's clear which one you take. Certainly in the Gödel system. You might have other com more complicated systems where it's not so clear. I agree with that. But those systems, I mean, we don't know the answer there. But in the ones I talk about, simple things with natural numbers and so on, it's if you really are talking about the natural numbers but not some system, whatever these things, the, uh, I've forgotten about these extensions, the um, alternative models you can have for your system, and for those alternative models you go the other way. But if it's the one you mean in the first place, it's clear which one you take. And it's not up to us which we take. But I'm, I'm not saying that your questions mightn't in some more subtle systems be genuine problems, not one example like the, the axiom of choice, or more importantly probably the continuum hypothesis. You might take a different attitude, and f as far as we know at the moment, either choice W would work. But I guess the point of view I'd be saying here that probably one of those choices is correct, but we need better means of reasoning and understanding to see one is just correct. It may well be that it's false. I think it's. I might put my money on that. Well, you see, we're no close to this. <laughs> in the physics, we're nowhere close to these things in mathematics. Sure, we have these puzzles about these very large infinities, but the extraordinary thing here in mathematics, you don't need any of them. You don't need anything bigger than C. Everything that you do in, in physic physics that I've seen involves a continuum and nothing bigger. It maybe there's a subtlety there because a continuum hypothesis might be false, and there is a subtlety there. I have a sort of suspicion that there might well be something there. But they're not all that, these are very huge infinities that people really have some questions about. One doesn't seem to touch on them, at least not yet. C could be, we come up against those later on, but not at the moment. Okay, much as it, 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 it hurts me, I think we're going to need to um, move on. But before, um, uh, before we're done with you today, <coughs> Um, I'd like to give you a, oh. a, a present. My Thank gosh, you for a your present. time. Thank you uh, so much. If, if we could just give one more <laughs> thanks.